Welcome back. In this video, Dr. Asad Khan and I talk to virologist Dr. Bupesh Prusti about the latest research that shows how reactivated latent viruses can cause havoc at a cellular level in both MECFS and long COVID. This is going to be a series of three films. I've tried to keep them shortish and digestible as some of it does get a bit technical. If it starts to melt your brain, I do a little sum up at the end, so you can just skip ahead to that if necessary. Let's dive in. So hi Bupesh, thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Um, I was wondering if we could start, just for people who aren't familiar with you and your work, if you could just relatively quickly sum up your professional history that's brought you to this point. I am a group leader here working in University of Würzburg. I am a virologist by training, but um, we focus mostly on um, post-virus interaction and um, we try to understand the uh, role of uh, mitochondria particularly and how it bridges the gap between the host and the virus and uh, controls the life cycle of both the organisms. Uh, in this regard, when we were working on herpes viruses um, during 2016, we came across um, the um, idea that um, viruses can manipulate um, mitochondria and that can cause to chronic viral illness. And from there, we started looking into different diseases and we found um, uh, MECFS um, to be a very interesting uh, disease. And then after the pandemic, we are working both on MECFS and long COVID, trying to understand what are the similarities, what are the differences and um, how to uh, understand the disease uh, pathomechanism. Yeah. Before the pandemic, with respect to MECFS, could you perhaps just briefly list what your main findings have been over the years? Yeah, so we have been hypothesizing over the years that um, chronic uh, illnesses like uh, MECFS um, is actually um, originating with the reactivation events of some of the latent viruses in our body. For example, herpes viruses are the one family of virus which uh, we all have in uh, many different forms. Uh, besides that, as you know, we also have uh, human endogenous retroviruses as a part of our genome. And we also have other RNA viruses like uh, Coxsackie virus, parvovirus, and things like that, which are very frequent cohabitant with, within our body. And we have a hypothesis that um, these viruses are normally dormant, normally latent, but under certain conditions, certain physiological conditions, they can get activated. A classical viral reactivation is a very simple condition clinically because then your immune system reacts to it and you get rid of the virus infection. But sometimes these viral deactivation events are very leaky or abortive. And these leaky and abortive viral reactivation events itself is capable of causing chronic illness. That's what the whole hypothesis is. And before the pandemic, we were working on herpes viruses and MECFS, and we came across the very interesting result, which we published in Nature last year, that a small microRNA from human herpes virus type 6, only this 23 nucleotide uh, small microRNA has the capability to change the mitochondrial morphology as well as metabolism, which itself can cause to chronic viral illness without having any other viral proteins, things like that. The, the classical idea or hypothesis that when we want to relate or correlate a virus infection to a disease, we need to have the whole viral infection in our body is not completely true. In the modern knowledge of science, we can claim that in the absence of complete viral reactivation, these viruses can cause a lot of physiological changes which can contribute to disease. This is the hypothesis with which we started working on MECFS. And at this moment, it also stands true for long COVID. So does this mean that you can't sort of go and get a blood test and test positive for these viruses when they're causing havoc? If, you, if we know the um, story of MECFS and uh, long COVID, um, majority of the work that has been going on at the level of clinic as well as basic science research is mostly focused on the peripheral circulation. We look into the blood, we look into plasma, we look into um, serum, we look into antibodies or T cells, and the B cells, and try to get an idea of, about the disease from this place. But this is only partially um, probably true because the peripheral circulation connects us only to the surrounding tissue, for example, the connective tissue. Yeah, But if we 
talk about the viral reactivation, which is happening far, far away from this area, which is mostly either in the brain or neurons or neuron associated cells like glial cells, astrocytes and things like that. Or the viral reactivation is happening in more specialized cells, which is mitochondria dependent, for example, muscle cells or cardiac myocytes. These are the cells or tissues where mitochondria function is very essential. And here, localized reactivation means a damage to very small proportion of cells can cause a large effect on the body. And anything which is happening in these localized tissues probably cannot be detected or measured in peripheral circulation. So we think that the direct consequence of the virus infection or reactivation is happening in localized tissue. But what we are trying to study in peripheral circulation is the indirect consequence of the virus infection and reactivation. That means we have two different sites of illness. One is acute illness site, the very early phase where the virus reactivation happens. And the second is the chronic illness stage, which is after a couple of weeks to a couple of months of time, when because of the viral deactivation, things starts to accumulate change and that we can see in the peripheral circulation. So we believe that um, all the neuronal abnormalities or autonomic nervous system related abnormalities can be explained through direct virus infection and reactivation or for example, immune modulations. And there is a possibility that auto recovery is possible within these first couple of weeks to months time. Yeah, so when, when we talk about the long COVID, few people claim that they were sick for a couple of months and then all of a sudden they did the yoga and all the other activities and they are all fine now, yeah? So they claim that this is all in the head and things like that. So we, we say that there is a biological mechanism to explain if there is an involvement of these lytic viruses, which tend to become latent. So you, you, the body needs some amount of time to make the viruses back to latency again. And this is the time when auto recovery is possible. But if the damage goes to the chronic illness part, then you see all the subsequent events like the fatigue, endothelial cell dysfunction and other things which is something where auto recovery is possibly very difficult. Your question is that whether we can detect the viruses um, in the blood or not. So which is people have tried millions of dollars has been spent in the past in MECFS field. And there is absolutely more or less um, nothing. But again, when we are talking about the paper that we are doing, where we also try to look into um, the antibody signature of herpes viruses. And we found that there is a really wide range of herpes virus reactivation signatures in terms of IgG against these herpes virus early proteins in the MECFS as well as, as, well as in the long COVID. Can you tell us a little bit more? If you can't test for it in the blood, how do you try and prove that this is happening? Um, is the IgG signature enough? Are there other signs that you can look at to sort of give you the smoking gun? Like where's the smoking gun here, basically? Yeah, so we are now going into a paper which is uh, submitted, which probably should come out as a preprint very soon. It's not in my hand, but again, it's a it's a not peer reviewed. So in this study, what we, um, we are hoping to uh, publish here, we have done a very large um, um, amount of analysis. So we have the German cohort of MECFS patients, and we have a large number of uh, long COVID patients. So we call it as a um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS positive uh, patients. So we have three different well-characterized groups of patients. Yeah, And this characterization is already published in a paper in 2022. And then, uh, very interestingly, we have compared this data to two different types of controls. One is a matching agent sex matched controls for our MECFS patients, but we went ahead and we took samples from the general population. We first tried to look into herpes virus signature. We talked about the herpes virus signature, yeah? So <clears throat> classically, you cannot detect the viral DNA if there is a localized virus reactivation happening, yeah? And all the clinical um, serological tests, which is available for um, EVV or HSV1 or HSV6, they are mostly based on uh, the late viral proteins, yeah? So in clinics, we believe that a viral deactivation is a viral deactivation when you have all the viral life cycle is complete, more or less. So you have early, immediate, early, late viral proteins. But our collaborators from Ohio State University, Marcel Williams and Maria Ariza, they have been working together with Nancy Klimas and others for a very long time. And they work on a specific group of a class of protein called as DUTPase proteins. 
So all the herpes viruses have these proteins and they're very immediate early proteins. And they have already found that as soon as the virus reactivates, there is a strong IgG response against these um, uh, proteins. So we try to use these IgG response as a signature. We try to see if we can find IgG response against these uh, herpes virus due to paste protein. So we specifically looked for HSV1, HSV6, and EVV in this study. We are trying to cover all the herpes viruses, which will take time. But we, in this study, we specifically focused on these three herpes viruses. So very interesting. First comparison between healthy control versus MECFS. So you see that MECFS patients in general have all the three herpes viruses in increased antibody response. Yeah. So um, EVV is very specific, um, statistically significant. The other two are not statistically significant, but still you have a tendency towards more IgG response against herpes virus um, antibodies. But the interesting thing is that it's very hard to tell when these MECFS patients had the uh, herpes virus reactivation because IgG can stay for a very long time in the blood, right? So we don't know exactly if these patients have the reactivation one month before, two months before, one year before. For that, long COVID was very interesting because all the patients in our cohort were having the COVID infection only 12 months before, yeah? So if we compare them to the healthy control general population, we expect that any change which we see can tell you that within the last 12 months, there is a viral reactivation happened here. And if you look into this, the HSV1 DUTPase was extremely strong in severe long COVID patients. It was more or less same in the um, uh, no long COVID group, the mild long COVID group, um, a little bit higher, but still the healthy control group, same similar. But severe long COVID group has a statistically significant high amount of antibody against HSV1 duty phase. Interestingly, the EVV and HSV6 duty phase showed the negative correlation, basically. So in um, long COVID groups, uh, no long COVID group, as well as mild long COVID and severe long COVID group, we had actually decreased antibody response. That also tells us that probably something is happening with the T cell and B cell biology after the virus reactivation or there is a decreased antigen presentation, something is going on, we need to understand this again. But all this, what tells us is that within the first 12 months of COVID infection, there is a change happening in the general population in terms of the herpes viruses. So there is a signature of herpes virus reactivation happening within this 12 month period. We cannot conclude the MECFS patient because we don't know the history, yeah? So that's that's why from these data, we, we came to the conclusion that there is a herpes virus reactivation happening. Uh, again, we went a little bit ahead here. Um, we argued that if there is a humoral response going on against the herpes virus due to base protein, so what are these proteins are actually doing? Because they have to be produced to get the IgG response. And if they are produced, even in the localized tissues, can they do tissue damage? Can they do something? And we went ahead in this paper and showed that um, these herpes virus due to base proteins are extremely potent in causing mitochondrial alterations. They cause a very specific phenotype, which is called hyperfusion of mitochondria. So they bring them all the mitochondria together into one place, fuse them together. So this is the first part of the paper, basically, where we show that there is a herpes virus signature in MECFS as well as long COVID patients which is also supported by the data from uh, Yale study and others There are many papers coming out. And we show that um, there is a way to do it. Um, we do not need to test the herpes virus DNA or anything like that. We can do through these IgG response in uh, against the herpes viruses. Also. So what Dr. Priesty is saying is that for reactivated latent viruses to cause chronic illness, they don't need to be reproducing widely and floating about in the bloodstream like they would with an acute infection. They can simply get busy at a localized cellular level where they mess with the mitochondria's ability to produce energy as well as as disrupting the normal immune response and creating inflammation. As such, we can't detect them with a normal blood test, but a specific test to look for the antibody signature that's created as a result is pretty conclusive. What makes sense for me about this part of the puzzle is how it could explain the delay in the onset of chronic symptoms after the acute infection, and how long COVID could be triggered by intense exercise or stress weeks or months after we've been ill in the first place. That intense physiological stress or demand for energy against an immunologically compromised landscape may be the trigger to reactivate these latent viruses and create the vicious cycle that perpetuates the symptoms of long COVID. 
In the next film, we discuss how autoimmunity is linked to this viral reactivation, what Dr. Proustie's thoughts are on SARS-CoV-2 viral persistence, and how you'd go about trying to treat this complex pathology. Look after yourselves. Until next time.